All right, folks. I don't know why it's working now, but I think it's working. So we're going to take advantage of it. So 3.5 is a section on the derivatives of trigonometric functions. So before we get carried away with all the trig, let's talk about what we know so far. OK, so what do we know? Well, I think we know that the derivative or d dx of a constant, so C stands for a constant, I believe we know that the derivative of a constant is zero. And I think that we know the derivative of x to a power just means we need to use the power rule. So we're going to bring the power down, n, and then x to the power of n minus 1. Okay. Um, one thing I want to make sure that we are aware of is that if we have a constant, we can sort of factor that out to the front. And so this one, this third one would be C times F prime of X, okay? So it's sort of that special case of the product rule where we have a constant multiple. Now, the next rule, was almost so straightforward that we didn't think about it as a rule, but we're considering u and v as two different functions. And when we add or subtract them together, we can take the derivative of u, so u prime, and then we just add or subtract it to the derivative of v, okay? So addition and subtraction is pretty straightforward, but it's the product or the multiplication and the quotient or the division that we need to be a little bit more careful of. So if I ask for the derivative of u times v, we're going to need u times dv plus v times du. Okay. And then last but not least, our quotient rule, we're going to have v du minus u dv over v squared. OK, and so those are all the rules that we know so far. OK, um, I would encourage you to practice these, uh, look up other examples of finding derivatives and just get in as much practice as you can. OK. All right. So what's new? All of this stuff, derivative of sine, cosine, tangent, cosecant, secant and cotangent, that's what we're going to be able to fill in by the end of class today. OK. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. All right, so let's take a look at this formal definition of the derivative, okay? And we're going to apply it to the sine function and see what happens, all right? Now, this part using um, proving this derivative using the formal definition, it's not something I will require on an exam. So if you're like, I don't really want to hear about it, you can sort of fast forward through this next part. Uh, but if you would like to, and you're kind of curious about where we get the derivative of sine from, this is one way to think about it. Okay, so I'm going to use the formal definition, the limit as h approaches zero of f of x plus h, so sine of x plus h minus sine of x all over h, OK? So all I've done is plug that into my f of x plus h minus f of x all over h. Now this next part, sine of x plus h, we're going to remember, huh, remember from a long time ago or whenever you took trigonometry, that there is a special rule for unpacking the sum of sine. And so that is sine x cosine h plus cosine x sine h minus sine x all over h. And so this sine x plus h, we used the sine sum formula, and we were able to expand it to look something like that. Okay. Now we're going to go ahead and collect some terms here. Okay. So I'm going to grab this first term and this last term and put that as one fraction. And then I'm going to take 
the second term, and I'm gonna put that over H as a second fraction, okay? So we're gonna end up with two separate fractions and limits here. The first one will be the limit as H approaches zero of sine X cosine H minus sine X all over H. And then my second fraction and limit will be plus the limit as H approaches zero of cosine X sine H all over H. And for the sake of room, I'm just gonna squeeze that in a little bit so we'll be able to see it all. All right. Now let's take a look at this first fraction. Whoops, at this first fraction here. And what we might notice is we can factor out a sine x here. And so that's precisely what we're going to do. The limit as h approaches 0 of, I'm going to bring the sine x to the front, and I'm going to have cosine h minus 1 over h. And when I look at the second one, I'm going to write this as two separate terms as well, the limit as h approaches 0 of cosine x times sine h over h, okay? Now, one thing that you might notice is that we've seen sine h over h before. Actually, that was one of the special limits we learned way back in the limits unit. Similarly, we also looked at cosine of h minus 1 over h as a special limit. So let's think back to what those became. Well, when I took the limit as h approaches 0 for this term, well, it went to 0. And when I took the limit as h approaches 0 of this term, well, we went to 1. And so let's see what we have left. This whole first term, this one right here, is going to go to 0, so I don't need to write it. But the next one is going to go to the limit as h approaches 0 of cosine x. And so everywhere we see an h, we're going to plug in 0, which is nowhere. So we're left with cosine What we've really shown right here is that the derivative of sine is cosine, okay? So the derivative of sine is cosine. All right, well, we can actually take a look at this um, using Desmos. So I've included a link here for you in case you are more of a visual learner, you're welcome to check out this link and see how the derivatives kind of um, work in relation to each other. This actually shows us the derivative of cosine as well on the same Desmos app, okay? All right, so if we go through a similar um, sort of thinking with the formal definition, and if we take a look at what the graph looks like on the Desmos activity, we would find that the derivative of cosine is actually negative sine of x, okay? So the derivative of cosine is negative sine of x. And let me go back up there and write down the rule for sine as well, okay? the derivative d dx of sine x is cosine x, okay? And so we can actually come back up to our what we what's new and fill in those first two. The derivative of sine is cosine. The derivative of cosine is negative sine, okay? All right, let's try some examples. All right, so example one says 
the derivative of 5x cubed times sine x. Shoot, let me read that one more time so we catch that word. I'm really hoping we got 5x cubed times sine x. Okay. Now, since I'm multiplying here, when I take that derivative, I better use that product rule. Okay. So let's set up for our product rule. U equals 5x cubed. V equals sine x. All right. Then du equals 15x squared and dv equals cosine x. Great. Now that we've got our setup, we're going to find our derivative is equal to u dv plus v du. And I'm going to plug in everything I found for u, v, and du, and dv. So we'll get 5x cubed times cosine x plus sine x times 15x squared. Okay, let's simplify that a tiny bit. We will get 5x cubed cosine x plus 15x squared sine x. And that, my folks, is the derivative of 5x cubed times sine x, okay? Great. Moving on to example two. We look at this, we read this as cosine x divided by 4x squared, okay? Cosine x divided by, cos uh, by 4x squared, which means we better be using the quotient rule. Because I can't simplify in this case. Like, I can't break it up into different fractions. So I just kind of got to use that quotient rule. Okay. So I'm going to set things up the same way. I'm going to get my u and my du and my v and my dv. Okay. U is the top function. So cosine x. And the derivative of cosine. I hope everyone remembers, has a negative in front, negative sine x. All right, the bottom function or v is 4x squared and the derivative of that is 8x. Great, we've got our setup. Let's plug everything into the quotient rule. v du minus u dv over v squared. Substituting in carefully, we get 4x squared times negative sine x minus cosine x times 8x all over 4x squared squared. And let's go ahead and just clean that up a tiny bit. So I'm going to shrink this so we can fit it. Whoop. Okay. And we'll get negative 4x squared sine x minus 8x cosine x all over 4x squared squared. That is our derivative of cosine x divided by 4x squared, okay? So not a lot is different. We just are, have some new rules. Now we know how to find the derivative of sine and cosine, and we're going to need to use them with all the other rules that we already learned, okay? All right, let's take a look at this example number three over here, sort of an application type question. So if we have S of T equals two sine T minus T, all right, so here's our function. And that function represents the position of a function at time T. Determine when the particle is at rest. So I'm going to start off with a sentence here. 
the particle is at rest when v of t equals zero. That's a sentence I want us to internalize. A particle is at rest when the velocity equals zero. Okay, that also helps set us up for what we're supposed to do now. Let's find v of t. Okay, well, v of t happens to be the derivative and specifically the first derivative of position. And so let's see. Well, two sine t will become two cosine t and the derivative of t becomes one. All right, so that's my velocity function. Two cosine t minus one. Now, because I'm looking for when the particle is at rest, I want to find out when that velocity equals zero. So set v of t equals zero to cosine t minus one equals zero. And then we're going to solve for t. So we're going to add that one to both sides. We're going to divide by two and we'll get cosine of t equals one half. Okay. Now let's, this is where we need to remember our trick, right? We're going to revisit that unit circle. Um, and if you're not really remembering that unit circle, there is that activity on Desmos. It's sort of like a trig review that you can use if you like. Okay, so if we have cosine of t equals one half, what we're really looking for is what angle has an x value of one half on the unit circle. Okay, and so I'll give you a moment to look at your unit circle. There should be two answers here. And I think we'll be able to identify one angle as pi over three and another angle as five pi over three, okay? Now, since this is a periodic function and it keeps going, that domain is from negative infinity to positive infinity, we can say all the solutions by saying plus two pi k, where k is an integer. That's what that z means. And similarly, we can say five pi over three plus two pi k, where k is an integer. Okay, and so there we have our solutions for when the particle is at rest, okay? We found the velocity function, we set it equal to zero, we solved for t, okay? All right, so it turns out that we don't just have derivatives for sine and cosine, but we also have them for all the other trig functions, okay? So let's use this table uh, sort of as a little organizer for ourselves to keep track of all the derivatives, okay? So what do we know so far? We know the derivative of sine is cosine x, and we know that the derivative of cosine is negative sine x. Great. All right. Let's tell you what the other ones are. The derivative of tangent is going to be secant squared x, okay? Now, as a friendly reminder, this is the same as saying secant x and then squaring the whole thing, okay? So those two things are the same, and that's gonna be really important for us to recognize especially when we get to section 3.6, okay? All right, now, 
I like to take a look at tangent and kind of compare it to cotangent. Turns out the derivative of cotangent is going to be negative cosecant squared x. And that is equal to negative cosecant x squared. Okay. So we might kind of notice that like these two kind of pair together tangent and cotangent kind of pair together, and whatever we get for cosecant and secant kind of pair together as well, okay? So the derivative of secant is actually secant x tangent x, and the derivative of cosecant is negative cosecant x cotangent x. Now, one kind of fun thing that I noticed in all my years of learning and also teaching is that any of the trig functions that start with a C, so like cosine, cosecant, cotangent, all of their derivatives are negative. So like the derivative of cosine is negative sine. The der derivative of, neg of cotangent is negative cosecant squared. And the derivative of cosecant is negative cosecant cotangent. Okay. So that might be a little trick to help you keep that in your brains a little bit better what those derivatives are. All right. Now that we've got the other derivatives, let's take a look at how we use that. Okay. So example four if f of x equals cotangent x, find the equation of the tangent line at x equals pi over four. All right, well, I'm gonna start the same way that I've started a lot of these tangent line problems, which is by writing out the equation that I'm going to be filling in. Y minus Y1 equals M parentheses X minus X1. And I know that at the end, I'm going to need to fill in my x1, which they give me. I'm going to need to fill in a y1, which I'm going to need to use the function in order to figure it out. And then last but not least, I'm going to need to find the slope. And I'm going to use the derivative to find that slope. Okay. Now. I like to find the things that I can find right away. So I'm going to go ahead and find f of pi over 4. So I can find that y1 value. So f of pi over 4 is cotangent of pi over 4. Now, if you don't remember what cotangent is, those are values we don't tend to memorize as much. We could say, hey, we know that's cosine of pi over 4 divided by sine of pi over 4. And we know those values from the unit circle as square root of 2 over 2 divided by square root of 2 over 2. And lucky for us, we've got some nice numbers on this Monday morning. And those reduce to 1. So that means that our y1 is f of pi over 4. We're going to be able to plug in a 1 there. All right, before we can write our equation, we got to find that slope. So slope is going to equal to f prime of pi over 4. Okay. Well, we don't want to plug in the pi over 4 first. We need to find f prime of x, and then we need to plug in pi over 4. So let's see, f prime of x is let's see cotangent so it's negative cosecant squared x okay just grab that from the chart right above and if i don't know what this is like that's really hard for me to think of the value in my head i can think about it as negative one over sine x squared okay so let's plug in our values and see what we get f prime of pi over 4 
is going to give me negative 1 over sine of pi over 4 squared. Now we know that sine of pi over 4 is root 2 over 2, so negative 1 over root 2 over 2 squared. Okay. Now this part always kind of trips people up, like how do we even find that? But I bet if you remember what it means to take a reciprocal, okay, I think we know we flip the top and bottom for a reciprocal. But one of the things we forget is sometimes a reciprocal is the same thing as saying one over something. So one over square root of two over two. Well. If we want that reciprocal, we can write it as 2 over root 2. And then we square that. Okay, So I took this fraction on the bottom, and I said, what's the reciprocal of it? 2 over root 2. And I knew that 1 over that fraction meant that I was looking for the reciprocal. Okay, and if we multiply this out, we'll get negative 4 over 2, or we'll get negative 2. Okay. Now that means that our slope, our slope, or our f prime of pi over 4 is negative 2. Now I've got all the numbers I need to write my equation. y minus 1 equals negative 2 x minus pi over 4, put a box around it, call it a day, there's your equation, okay? All right, example 5. Over the interval 0 to 2 pi, okay? So we're only thinking one time around the unit circle. When does this function y equals secant x over 1 plus tangent x have horizontal tangents, OK? And so let's kind of think about that for a moment. Write a sentence about what this means before we start figuring things out. So a function has horizontal tangents when y prime equals zero. Okay. So a function has horizontal tangents when the derivative equals zero. It's a lot like when a particle is at rest, has a horizontal tangent, okay? So now that means we gotta find y prime y prime of this. And I see a fraction, so I'm thinking we're going to need quotient rule. Okay, so let's make a note of this. We're going to need quotient rule. And let's write out some steps. Okay, so step one, find y prime. So u equals secant x and v equals one plus tangent x. That means du equals, go back to that chart, we've got secant x tangent x and dv, okay, derivative of one is zero and derivative of tangent is secant squared. All right, that's our setup. Let's put that into the quotient rule. y prime, equals v, so 1 plus tangent x times du minus u times dv all over v squared. All right. Now, let's see. I'm going to do a little bit of simplification here. Maybe I should go across. I've got 
secant x tangent x plus secant x tangent squared x minus secant cubed x all over one plus tangent x squared. Okay. Now, one thing that we might remember um, is that no matter what things look like, we can always factor things out, okay? And so what I notice is that all three terms in the numerator have a secant in common. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull the secant out to the front and I've got tangent x plus tangent squared x minus secant squared x. Now, throwback also to trigonometry, one of the Pythagorean identities says that tangent squared minus secant squared gives you one. So we can take this term and we can replace it with one, okay? So we really have secant x times tangent x plus one over one plus tangent x squared, All right? And that is my y prime, all right? Now I'm purposely not going to reduce here. I know some of you might be already reducing that last term that I chose not to reduce, but I'm gonna show you why in just a second. Okay, so we found our y prime, but what was the end game? A function has a horizontal tangent when y prime equals zero. So now we have to set y prime equal to zero. What that gives us is secant x times tangent x plus one over one plus tangent x squared equals zero. And this is a really important conceptual piece because what we're talking about here is we wanna make sure that the um, numerator here, is zero, okay? So we wanna make sure that the numerator is equal to zero. That is the only way to get zero out of a fraction, okay? So when we are setting this equal to zero, what we're really saying is when does secant, that's a weird looking secant, when does secant x times tangent x plus one equal zero? That's really what we're looking for, okay? All right, so now let's solve for x. Well, when I take this expression and I say, well, let's go ahead and find zero, we have secant x equals zero, and we also have tangent x plus one equals zero. This, if you remember secant, secant can actually never be zero. So secant x is not equal to zero. And you can look at a graph of that. So if you throw secant x on, on Desmos, take a look at the graph. I think you'll see that secant never has an x-intercept, okay? However, if we solve this second part, we really get tangent x equals negative one. And that gives us x being uh, three pi over four and five pi over four. No, not five pi, seven pi, sorry. Seven pi over four, okay? So 
we're really ramping things up now. A lot of algebra, a lot of trig, and they're all kind of interwoven with each other. Okay, so I'll give you a moment to kind of you know rewatch this part if you if you find that um, will be helpful. Okay, but if you still have questions afterwards, like someone suggested, just come on by to office hours, and I'd be happy to help you out. Um, or you can go check out the tutoring sessions. Okay. All right. Let's move along. So d to the fourth y, dx to the fourth of sine x. Now that is asking us to find the fourth derivative, okay? So right here, this notation is saying find the fourth derivative. Okay, find the fourth derivative. So what are we going to do? We're going to find the first one, the second derivative, the third derivative, and then the fourth derivative, and then we can stop. So y equals sine x, that's my beginning point, y prime equals cosine x. All right, y double prime. Let's see, what's the derivative of cosine? It is negative sine, okay? Y triple prime. What's the derivative of negative sine? It's gonna be negative cosine and y to the fourth, that fourth derivative. Sometimes we write that as a Roman numeral, not like four little lines. We're gonna end up with sine x, okay? So it turns out that the fourth derivative of sine is also sine, okay? Now, I thought this was an important example to choose because when we were only looking at the power rule, a lot of folks said, yeah, at some point the derivative is gonna be zero. And I just wanted to sort of remind us that that was maybe a great observation for power rule. However, as we learn about different kinds of functions, it might not always be true, okay? So that's just something I want us to keep in mind that when we keep taking derivatives with power rule, yes, at some point they're gonna become zero, but with other functions that not, that's not necessarily true, okay? All right. Let's take a look at example seven. And I believe that is the last example for this lesson, okay? So find the first derivative if f of x equals three over x to the fourth minus two root x tangent x, okay? Now, I'm gonna show us what I really hope we do not do, okay? So don't do this, please. Okay. Uh, let's say I was trying to take the derivative and I forgot all about the rules that we learned. I might try and do this. Three over four x cubed minus two uh, derivative of one of root x is one over two root x. And derivative of tangent is secant squared. Done. Why should we not do that? Think about that. Okay. Instead, what we should do is do a little bit of work first where we rewrite our function to make sure we're applying rules appropriately, okay? So number one, I'm always gonna encourage you to rewrite your function. And so in this case, I would probably choose to rewrite it as f of x equals three x to the negative four minus two x to the one half tangent x, I might even put a multiplication symbol in there. 
Okay. What rules does this tell me? I'm going to need the power rule. I'm going to need the product rule. Okay. So now let's kind of do this. Um, I'm going to set up the product rule right under here. Okay. So let's say step two is find derivative. So for my product rule, I'm going to let u be 2x to the 1 half, and I'm going to let v equal tangent x. That means du is two times one half x to the negative one half or x to the negative one half, which I can write as one over the square root of x. My dv is secant squared x. Okay. Now I'm going to Line f prime of x. So every derivative here, I'm going to go ahead and find each one, and then I'm going to connect them with a subtraction sign because it's a negative 2x to the 1 half. Okay. So let's see, we're going to get f prime of x equals let's go back and look at just that power rule one i'm going to have three times negative four x to the negative four minus one that's my first term minus i'm going to open up a parentheses because i got to use the product rule with this whole thing here so u vv plus v times du, okay? Now, let's simplify. This will give me f prime of x equals negative 12 x to the negative five, minus 2 root x secant squared x minus uh, tangent x times 1 over root x. And I'm going to go ahead and write this so that there are no negative exponents and that I have put one fraction wherever I can have it as a single fraction. So I'm going to get negative 12 over x to the fifth minus two root x secant squared x minus tangent x over root x. And that, my dears, is the first derivative of the function we were given, okay? And so if I sort of squeeze this on one screen, you can see that that thing in the red is very different than our final answer, okay? So it's really important that we are developing our decision-making skills, like how do we know what rule to use, okay? That is maybe the best thing you can do for yourself is to practice making those decisions. Which rule do I need to use? And am I confident that that rule is correct, okay? So that's it for 3.5. If you have any questions, uh, definitely come stop by office hours or tutoring and I am happy to help you out. And with that, I'm gonna say goodbye and see you in the 3.9 video.